we are looking through the Christmas story, and what we're doing is we're picking out characters that we want to uh, teach you how they responded to what was going on in the Christmas story. So we've taught a lot of different characters over the years. For example, I've taught about the three wise men. Uh, Brian last year taught about the three wise men. So today, I'm going to teach you about three of the characters of Christmas that I've never taught about before as a group. It is the three women of Christmas. I'm not calling them the three wise women simply because that's not how they're referred to in the story. But they were wise, and you could see that in their life. So we're going to look at these three women. All three played a significant role in the Christmas story. One of them was married. One of them was single. One of them was widowed. The first one is Elizabeth. The second one is Mary. The third one is Anna. Each of these three women faced a major obstacle, a major obstacle in their life. Elizabeth faced a major disappointment. She was old and had spent her entire life being unable to bear a child. She'd been childless her entire life. Mary faced a major change. She's young, she's pregnant, she's single. How's she going to explain that? Anna had to deal with the loss of her husband. Disappointment, change, and loss were the three things these three women had to face. They each overcame their challenge because they chose to live by faith. They chose to trust God in their situation. Elizabeth overcame resentment and bitterness. Mary overcame her fears. Anna overcame her grief. They were able to do this because they all three made wise choices. So how do you know when somebody is wise? You know that by looking at the decisions that they make. Wise people make wise decisions. Foolish people make foolish decisions. Unwise people make unwise decisions. If you want to know if you are wise, if I wanted to know if you are wise, all I have to do is look at the decisions that you've made. Look at the challenges that you face and the decisions that you made because of that. Because in your life, your decisions reveal whether you are wise or not. The Bible says this about the wisest man who ever lived. His name was Solomon. He was the king of Israel. And it's significant because God gave him wisdom. God said to him, I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? You ask for it, I will give it to you. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for fame. He didn't ask for comfort. He asked for wisdom. He said, God, I want to be wise. And he became the wisest person in the world. First Kings 3.28, the Bible says this about him. The people saw that Solomon had God's wisdom by the decisions that he made. What I want us to do this morning is to look at the three decisions that these three women made so that we could see how they were wise so that we could make those same decisions when we face challenges. We could learn from their choices. First woman of Christmas is Elizabeth. We find her story in Luke chapter one, and I'm gonna start in verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. Now, in these verses, we learn a couple of things about this first woman, about Elizabeth. In verse six, we learn that Elizabeth was righteous, which means she lived rightly. She did the right thing in her situations. And she was obedient to all of the Lord's commands. Now, as your pastor and mentor, that's what I want God to be able to say about you. I want God to be able to say that you are righteous and obedient to all of God's commands. You know, you might hear the term a godly woman or a godly man. This is a good definition of what that means. That's what it means to be a godly woman. You are righteous and obedient to God. That's what it means to be a godly man. You honor God with your life. The Bible says she was righteous. She lived for God. She lived God's way. She was devout. She was dedicated to living for God. We also learn that she has been carrying a lifelong 
heartbreak, a lifelong hurt. In verse seven, it says she had no children. So as, as, as I've been thinking about this, I, I'm thoughtful to the reality that some of you can identify with this heartbreak. You've wanted to have a child, but you haven't. You've wanted to be a mother, but it hasn't happened for you. You've wanted to be a father, but it hasn't happened for you, at least not yet. The Bible says that Elizabeth was honoring God. She was a woman of faith. Now this hurt and heartbreak in her life was that her desire for a child and her prayer for a child hadn't been answered. She, she still was childless. What this means is that Elizabeth had the temptation to get bitter, to get resentful. She had the temptation to get resentful against God because she could say, God, I have served you. I have loved you. I have done what is right. I have honored you. I have worshiped you. And yet you haven't answered my biggest prayer. I've wanted a child and it hasn't happened. For a lot of people that turns them toward getting bitter and resentful. But Elizabeth didn't go there. She made a different choice. You could probably think about something in your life that you've prayed about and it hasn't happened. You face a choice. You could choose to get bitter about that or you could choose to get better because of that. You could choose to get mad at God or you could choose to trust God in your situation. There's another lesson we could learn here. The lesson to me is that we need to learn that living for God, being devoted to God, being wholeheartedly committed to God, that does not guarantee a hurt-free life. God never said everything was gonna happen just the way you want it to happen. We need to recognize and realize that this is not heaven. This is earth. Don't expect heaven on earth. In heaven, there is no sorrow, no suffering, no sadness, no problems, no pressure, no pain, no disappointment, no, pe no tears, no grief, no loss. None of those things exist in heaven. But this is not heaven. This is earth. And everything on earth is broken. And it has been broken since Adam and Eve sinned. That broke everything. To expect heaven on earth it is going to set you up for disappointment. You're going to be expecting something that's not going to be a reality. It's not going to happen because this is not heaven. Heaven is what we have to look forward to. Earth is where we have to live while we're waiting. Nothing works perfectly on this planet. The weather doesn't work perfectly. The economy doesn't work perfectly. Your relationships, they don't work perfectly. Your body does not work perfectly. Everything is broken. We need to recognize that living for Christ does not guarantee a pain-free life. In fact, Jesus said just the opposite of that. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might, he didn't say you could, he said you will have trouble in this world. He says you're gonna have trouble, so don't be surprised when things don't work out the way you want them to, or the way you hope they will, or the way that you pray for them to work out. We shouldn't be surprised when we have pain in our lives because this is not heaven. Elizabeth had wanted a baby all of her life and it hadn't happened. And she still trusted God through all of that, through all of those years. We pick up her story in Luke uh, verse eight. This is also the story of the birth of John the Baptist. Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary. She also became the mother of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, was the forerunner to Jesus. He was the announcer of the Messiah. And so he's, he's born just a little bit before Jesus. 
And he is, as he grows older, he is announcing the coming of the Messiah. Here's what it says in verses uh, 8 through 13. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood. He was chosen to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the timing for the burning of the incense came, all of the assembled worshipers were outside praying. They were outside praying. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Tells him what he wants him to be named. That is so significant. The angel says, your prayers have been heard. You've been praying all of your life for something, and now it's going to happen. God has heard your prayers. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to name him John. We know him as John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for Jesus, who would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. But then something interesting happens. In verse 18, Zechariah says to the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Oh no! He just doubted this angel. And this wasn't just any angel. You get into verse 19 and 20, the angel said to him, I I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And it is he who sent me to speak to you, to tell you of this good news. And now, because you have doubted these words that I have brought to you, you will be silent and not able to speak until this happens, because you did not believe my words which will come true in their appointed time. This fascinates me. It just grips me. He said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. God chose. You know the Hallmark, Hallmark card? If you, I don't know how it goes, but you will send the very best. God sent his very best angel, the angel that stands in his presence. You know, I, I could picture, you know, you know, there's this break and they go to the water cooler and one of the other angels said, hey, hey, hey Gabriel, what have you been doing today? I've been standing in the presence of God. Same as I did yesterday. Same as I will do tomorrow. That is fascinating to me because here is this angel, Gabriel, that God sent with a message, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Now, meanwhile, all the people outside of the temple are wondering what's taking Zechariah so long. He simply went into the temple to light the incense. That doesn't take very long. Why isn't he back out here? What's taking him so long? But then when he does come out, he can't speak. He tries to speak, but he can't. And so he's using his hands. He's trying to sign what, what, what is going on because he cannot speak. This tells me that there is always consequence to our choices. He chose to doubt, and there was a consequence for that doubt. He wasn't able to, to speak again because he doubted the message that the angel Gabriel brought from God to give to him, Zechariah doubted it. So he wasn't gonna be able to, to speak again until this message came true at its appointed time. Another lesson here is that the timing of God, for them it was years, it was a lifetime. But the timing of God is better than my timing. I want things to happen at a certain time at a certain interval. But my timing is not God's timing. God's timing is always better. Elizabeth had her timetable for a baby. 
But God has had his timetable for a baby for them. She had her plans, but she knew that she could trust God. She could have faith in God in the midst of this. In verse 24 and 25, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. She takes this moment and she gives all of the credit to God. She honors God with this. She said, God has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace. She lived in a very different culture than what we live in. She lived in a culture where a woman's value was, she was valued highly based on the number of children that she had. The more children she had, the more she was valued. Elizabeth has none. There was a sense that in her community, she had no value because she wasn't bringing children into the community. She she says, God has taken away my disgrace because she felt that shame, that disgrace from her people. She acknowledges that God has done this. God came through and she's gonna have a child. And she's not going to have just any child. She's going to give birth to someone who years later, Jesus says, this is the one of the greatest men to ever live. Referring to John the Baptist. Elizabeth made a significant choice. She chose to trust God's plan. She chose to put her faith in God. She could have chosen to be bitter. She could have chosen to be resentful, but instead she chose to to honor God with her life, to trust God, to trust God's timing, to trust God with her future. The second woman of Christmas is Mary. I'm not going to say a whole lot about Mary because Pastor Brian gave us an excellent teaching about Mary last week. If you missed it, you can listen to it. It's on, it's on the website. It's on uh, Spotify. It's easy to find. If you were here, you know how excellent that teaching was about Mary. So all I'm going to do this morning is highlight just a few things. We find her story in Luke 1, 26 through 56. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, The angel went to her and said, greetings, you you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Can I just have to point this out again? Do you see which angel God sent? God is fully invested in the Christmas story, in what we are going to experience, in why the Christmas story. God sent the angel Gabriel. Verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greetings this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and we will be called the son of the most high. In verse 29, Mary is shocked and troubled. But you get down to verse 28. And she responds with this. I am the Lord's servant. May your words be, may your words to me be fulfilled. She did not respond with doubt. She responded to the message that God sent her with surrender to God's will. And then the angel left her. Then Mary travels to see her relatives, Zechariah and Elizabeth. When she arrives, there is great joy And Elizabeth says this to Mary, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. This is when Mary responds to the beautiful song that that Slaney sang for us last Sunday. The beautiful song of Mary's praise to God for who he is and what he is doing. Mary surrenders to the will of God because she heard the message. She heard the truth. 
Have you done that? Have you surrendered your life to the will of God? If you haven't, why not? Why haven't you surrendered? Maybe that's your number one takeaway from this message. I will surrender my will to God's will. Mary chose to believe God and to go with God's plan for her life. Mary chose to believe God's word. That's what she chose. Third woman of Christmas is Anna. There's not a whole lot said about Anna, but she has a significant piece in the Christmas story. Anna's story is in Luke chapter two. It says this, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, referring to Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated, dedicated to the Lord. You get into verse 25 and 26, it says, there was also a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He, he was righteous and devout. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. Hey, that's cool. Everybody's waiting for the Messiah, but the Holy Spirit reveals to Simeon, you will not die. You are devout. You are faithful. You will see the Messiah before you die. So Joseph and Mary are taking Jesus to the temple. The Holy Spirit prompts Simeon to go to the temple because, hey, this needs to happen in his lifetime. He goes to the temple. And in the temple, he finds Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus. In verse 28, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people in Israel. And then you get down to verse 36. This is where Anna comes into the picture. It says, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband <clears throat> seven years. So she got married, lived for seven years. Her husband dies. Now she's 84 years old. She's a widow. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at this very moment while, while Simeon is, is holding the baby Jesus and praising God and making this declaration about him. Anna comes up at that very moment, gives thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Anna made a significant choice. She worshiped God and she talked about Jesus to everyone who was looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And his choice was to worship God, to enter into God's presence, to worship him and to speak about Jesus. That is so significant. That is so wise. It is wise to worship God and to speak about Jesus. Basically, her life story, she could have said, I, I've lost the love of my life. I'm alone. But I'm going to use my life to focus on God's presence. I'm going to worship God all of the time. I'm going to love God all of the time. I'm going to pray to God all of the time. I'm going to focus on God and I'm going to tell people about Jesus. My thought is, why don't you be like Anna? Let's all be like Anna and say, I'm going to focus on God's presence. I'm not going to focus on my pain, on my grief, on my sorrow, on my loss. I'm going to focus on telling people about Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. All three of these women had heartaches. Elizabeth, she's a married woman unable to have a child for all of these years. Heartache, pain. 
Mary's a single woman with a pregnancy that, that's hard to explain. It's just kind of hard to tell people. Oh, Mary, you're pregnant. Who's the dad? That's pretty hard to explain. Yeah, I, I'm pregnant, but the dad is God, the Holy Spirit. Anna is a widow who spent most of her life with no family, alone. They could have given in to resentment or fear or grief, but they each made right choices. They made wise choices. Are you willing to make the same choices that these women made? Will you choose to trust God's plan instead of getting bitter? Will you choose to believe God's word instead of giving in to your fears? Will you choose to worship God and tell people about Jesus? For me, the, these are the takeaways of, of this part of these characters of the Christmas story. I want to trust God's plan, even when things don't work out the way I think they should work out, or they don't work out in the time frame that I think they should work out in. I want to believe God's word. I want to take God's word for exactly what it says and live according to that. I want to live in God's presence, to worship God. And I want to tell people about Jesus because he is the Messiah, the Savior. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful. I, I, I just constantly come to these points of gratefulness for who you are and for what you do. Father, I pray that we would put our trust in you. I pray that we would be devoted to you like these women were. I pray that we would be men and women of faith and that our faith would show up in trusting you and your plan for us, in committing our life to your will, in not giving in to fear, but in giving in to trust and to faith. I pray that we would believe your message, your word, and that we would base our life on it. And I pray that we would especially in this setting, at this time, in this building, I pray that we would worship you. And I pray that here and everywhere, we would tell people about your son, Jesus, about what he means to their life, about how they can commit their life to him, embrace him, follow him. I pray we would do that in the name of your son, whom all this is about, the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.